And good morning. We serve a risen Savior. He's the great, true, and living God of heaven. I'm glad to know him this morning. And I want to tell you, he changed my life as a senior in high school years ago. In just that moment of time, all things were made new. What a wonderful Savior. I want you to listen to the words of this song as a choir sings that theme in a moment of time, what God in heaven can do. Stand as the choir joins us, and we sing hymn number 628. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. My Savior's love, lift your voice, 628.
what a beautiful song. And I'm so thankful that God loves me as he does. With a perfect love, everlasting love, nothing I can do to make him love me any more or any less. What a wonderful Savior. Say hello to someone today. Let's greet one another. Shake someone's hand and introduce yourself to someone you don't know. As we also welcome those who are watching by the video today online, whether it's Facebook or YouTube, or maybe our website, shininglightmonroe.com. Those who are also listening by way of radio, we appreciate you being a part of this service today as well. God bless you. Let's remain standing. You know, today we're free people in Jesus Christ. The cross is our statue of liberty. But think about it. We have the freedom in our country because of so many who've gone before us. They've paid the ultimate price with their lives. I never want to take that for granted, that we have the freedoms that we have because of the sacrifices of others. We're praying for our country. We're praying for our leaders that they would know the Lord, that they would judge righteous judgment, praying for those in authority, that God would have mercy upon them and upon us. And so let's think about our country. Let's think about the freedoms that we are blessed with as we sing hymn number 681. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies. 681.
God's people said, Amen. And may the Lord mend our every flaw. We have them, but we continue to strive toward a more perfect union and uh, praying for our country for revival in these days, but also the patriot dream that sees beyond the years. Every church, every Christian should live a life that looks beyond their own. They see the big picture. It's not about just me and my time. What about those who come after me? I told our children yesterday as we were talking in the home about some things that I wish that I had as a younger man and never had that opportunity to receive, but the things that I prayed that God would help me to give to those who come after me. And uh, we need to have that kind of big picture view, and may the Lord help us, because the freedoms that we have, it's up to every generation to secure them. And we have to do what is right, and we understand all it takes for evil to flourish is for good men to do nothing. So we have to do our part, and may the Lord help us. Let's do our part in giving is unto the Lord. We bring on the Lord's day the Lord's tithe and our offerings. And then as we pray this morning, we're praying for Brother Ronald Reynoso and our Spanish-speaking service in the chapel, as well as those who rode our buses today. I love the bus ministry. I rode a bus to Sunday school, me and my brother, as little boys growing up in that broken home. But I'll tell you what, the grace of God is so sufficient. He not only saved us both, but today we're both in pulpits by God's grace, pastoring churches. Isn't that amazing? Pray for our bus ministry that God will bless it. But let's bow together. Our Father, we love you and thank you for your great love for us. Lord, I want to thank you for saving me and calling me into your service. I know I don't deserve it. But Lord, I pray that you would help us all now in this time to reflect, to be reminded of who you are, the opportunity you've given us, the freedoms that we enjoy. Lord, not only the privileges, but Lord, the responsibilities that are before us. And I pray, dear God, that you would help us to seek your face. We need revival in our own hearts, our homes, our church, our city, Lord, and beyond. We pray for a moving of the Holy Spirit in our hearts today. Bless your word. And Lord, I pray that you would bless our services on this campus, Lord, that Jesus Christ would be exalted, that people would trust him by faith this day. And Lord, that you would be honored in all things. We commit ourselves and this service to you, in Jesus' name, amen.
beautifully done. And I'm so thankful that we serve that risen Savior, and he lives within my heart. And so we appreciate Majesty Music and the Hamiltons and, and uh, all that God has done through them and continues to do. And uh, the life and ministry that God has blessed through them now and this next generation coming up as well. And uh, so it's our privilege and honor to have them with us this morning and uh, again tonight and then tomorrow we're having a special chapel and uh, we'll have another guest this evening, uh, Brother Steve Lilly and uh, he's with The Voice in the Wilderness. His young daughter has written a book about the Constitution and how young people can understand it. And uh, so they're going to put on a presentation for our chapel in the morning. Then we're going to have like a roundtable discussion about Christians in the arts. I believe it's so vital that young people need to see there are opportunities in that realm. And we need to step into those opportunities and encourage our young people as such. So we look forward to that. And then tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock... Here in the auditorium is our Academy Spring Concert, and uh, we'll have our different groups singing and uh, grades and things like that, songs they did for fine arts this year, and uh, just an exciting time. I want you to be here tomorrow evening, invite people to come, and we look forward to what God will have in store for us. Now, the service tonight is at 6, and then we just, uh, we'll just have a brief choir practice at 5.30, and then... We also look forward to what God is going to do throughout this coming next few weeks because school is about to wrap up, and we've got several events, and I'll be saying more about that as we go. And so I'm thankful for what God has done and the opportunities that God has given. This is Salt and Light Sunday, and we're just trying to encourage one another to be that salt and that light to preserve, to inform, to instruct, to give that guidance in this night of darkness. Uh, you think about it, we can curse the darkness or we can light a candle. We can do our part. And as a church, we respect what God has given us in his word. He's ordained the home, the church, and government. And uh, we have a role in that. We have a voice. We have something that we could effect and have a part in that. And we respect not only the Lord and his word, but we respect every individual and uh, we would never tell anyone or endeavor to tell someone how to vote. But we can help inform you and uh, help you meet people and know people that would encourage you about their path and how God has led them to be involved in that area. And uh, I want you to be praying that God will bless us and use us and uh, work in our hearts this very day. I appreciate Mark Walker being here. And uh, I've known Brother Walker for some time now, and uh, he's served in Congress. He is a candidate and uh, running for office. But I thought it would be good for him to come. And uh, this is not a campaign rally, but as a also ordained preacher of the gospel, preach to us and tell us how God has worked in his life. And I uh, led him down that path and then challenge us to pray for those in authority. And so he's going to come and speak to us in just a moment from God's word. But we're going to have the Majesty Music singers come, this trio, and they're going to sing two songs for us. And we look forward to hearing them. And then Brother Walker is going to come. And so let's let the Lord speak to us and let the Lord draw us closer unto himself. God bless you. Well, it's an honor for us to be with you today. As many of you know, uh, Shelly's husband, Ron, who is Patch the Pirate, if you've ever heard of the Patch the Pirate ministry, uh, he has dementia, so he uh, no longer travels uh, as he is uh, really starting to decline and kind of coming to the end of uh, his struggle with that. Uh, but Shelly is with us. How many of you ever heard Patch the Pirate, just out of curiosity? Okay, so a good, a good number of you. Um, well, we, my wife and I came on a couple years ago, and we have continued uh, writing them. We've done one a year. They're on a lot of Christian radio stations. It's like a comedy musical uh, adventure series for kids and adults, I guess, alike. Um, but uh, every story teaches different Bible lessons, and uh, a lot of them present the gospel. And I was thinking about the theme being salt and light. And a couple years ago, we uh, had an adventure called Mystery Island, and the crew goes to this island, and they're trying to figure out what's on there, and they discover that a, uh, a Japanese holdout soldier, which were actually a real historical thing, we're, we're still on, he's still on the island, and he thinks that the war is still going on, and he's still fighting this great cause for the emperor and for this kingdom that passed away years and years ago, and he's lived his whole life basically believing falsehoods and believing this lie and fighting for a kingdom that didn't matter and didn't exist. And... Um, 
just thinking through how relevant that is for, uh, for really all of us before Christ. We're living for ourselves. We're building our own kingdom. We're, we're believing all these untruths. And people without the gospel, that's the way they live their lives. And they desperately need uh, the light of Jesus Christ. They need to know um, the saving knowledge of him. And the song that Megan's going to sing is uh, called Can It Be? And it asks several questions. Um, and the very first one is, can it be that a man who died 2,000 years ago is what our world so broken needs today? Can it be? of you that were in the Sunday School Hour, you know that I serve in the uh, General Assembly as a state representative in South Carolina, and um, you know there's so many different things that we as people put our uh, trust in. We put it in government, we put it in uh, wealth and security and family and people, and you know we cling to these things and we sometimes make them our idols and we live for them and we pursue significance in them, but different times in life, each one of them fails and is torn away. Your health is torn away, that your spouse is gone. Uh, your, you know, if you're in Ukraine, your government structure, any kind of physical safety is just gone and evaporates. And, and you learn pretty quick in those times 
that you have to cling to something that's so much greater than some kind of worldly uh, thing that we could hold to. And as believers, we have the name of that person to cling to, Jesus Christ. You know, God loved us so much and loved this world so much that he sent Jesus Christ, our Savior, to, to live here as a person to, and tells us his name and his story and tells us he's alive today and is somebody that we can walk with and have a relationship with. And this song, Carry Me Tenderly, just really reflects on that truth that we serve a God um, who knows us, knows our faults, and can carry us through uh, really anything we go through uh, in life. And the, the text is written by Fanny Crosby, and it's Carry Me Tenderly. Carry me tenderly, Jesus, my Savior, shelter me safe in your arms so strong, Jesus, my Thank you for the <clears throat> wonderful worship today. I always enjoy being somewhere. There's nothing wrong than professionally worshiping the Lord with a good sound. and We like that and we appreciate that very much. And thank you for the ministry there. Uh, we might have to work in a, a Ron Hamilton reference to somewhere along the message there. So as we go through. Uh, but uh, but just uh, want to say thank you for allowing us to be here today. I'll give you a little bit of my background and then kind of weave in some things when it talks about uh, salt and light and where we are as a country and what I believe as believers is our calling as we move forward. I, uh, I grew up in the panhandle of Florida, or as some Floridians call it, the Redneck Riviera, uh, or L.A., Lower Alabama, a little town outside of Pensacola, Florida named Milton, Florida. And my dad there pastored, and uh, I'm the oldest of three boys, so we either either at the ball field or at church. That's basically the two places we grew up. Uh, was blessed that my mom and dad, my dad started a Christian school there and had a chance to attend Christian school from kindergarten to the 12th grade. And I, 
And I'll talk a little bit about why that's so important for those of you making that investment and certainly Pastor Tim and the work that you guys have done. It makes a difference, and not just for one generation, but many generations to come. As far as what we're seeing in some of the darkness and the intentionality into our public education as we've seen. Well, I grew up there. My dad moved us um, to Houston, Texas in August of 89 and for 16 years there in Florida. I arrived in Houston, Texas in August of 89, hottest place I have ever been, Pastor Tim. I, I was telling this story to my DC staff one day uh, about a cassette tape that literally was melting on my dashboard in Houston, Texas. And one 25-year-old raised his hand, no deference to our younger people, who raised his hand and asked me, boss, what's a cassette tape? He's no longer with us, but that's for different reasons there. But, but, uh, but, but I moved to Winston-Salem, North Carolina in 1991. I had $600 in my pocket. I had met a young lady at a Christian College there in Florida, and I had arrived and realized that she had kind of moved on with her life, but I wasn't driving 1,200 miles back to Houston, Texas, and I embarrassed, so I made Winston-Salem my home and uh, pursued business and finance there for about six years. Uh, it wasn't long, though, that when I was there that uh, a gentleman came into our business and it didn't take me long to identify an independent Baptist preacher since, uh, since I grew up with one. But uh, I went over and talked to him. He began to invite me to his church. And I said, well, I had been visiting another church called Gospel Light Baptist there in the area. But he continued to, Ron Beatty continued, as you might imagine, continued to talk. And finally I said, okay, this Sunday I'll come join your church or come visit your church. Well, that Sunday morning, like I had said, off I went to looking for his church. Well, I got lost. I didn't remember, you know, when somebody gives me directions, if it's more than two steps, step three or four, I'm kind of checking out on you, okay? So if you can tell me in two steps, I can make it happen. But I, I went looking for his church and I got lost. 10.30, 10.45, 11 o'clock came. And I said, man, I've got to be somewhere in church this morning. And I was 21, almost 22. I guess I was 22 years old at the time. And even at that age, uh, my fear of the Lord and the fear of my mom, even though she lived 1,200 miles away, was about equivalent, if I can share that, because if she found out. But anyway, I, I kept passing this one church called Grace Baptist Temple. Well, I said, it's 11 o'clock. i got to go somewhere this morning. So I pulled in. The music had already started. And I see this blonde sitting over the second row. Now, it was worth coming back the next Sunday. Now, I have no recollection of what her daddy was preaching on uh, either one of those Sundays. I had to act like I did when I weaseled my way for Sunday lunch, but we, we will have been married 30 years uh, later this year. She is a family nurse practitioner there at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center and has done some wonderful uh, things in her own ministry. But we served in the church there, in her dad's church, uh, music and worship, uh, recreation director, all the different things that we were able to do. But about age 26, I did something that I promised that I would never do, and that would be to follow my dad's footsteps as a Baptist pastor. And here's why. I wanted you to handle your junk, and I would handle mine, okay? Because <laughs> here's the thing. There's a supernatural calling for people who are called to ministry, who are called to pastor. It is not organic or natural that as you walk through life and you're carrying the different things, then you can make space that is able to walk with your journey as well. Pastor Tim and others, they, that's a supernatural calling God has placed on his life to be able to invest back into yours, not just skim along the edges, but to love and to pray and to shepherd and lead. And frankly, I wanted to know part of it. After about four or five months of praying, I had fortunately some grounding that if you're running from the Lord, that's not a good thing either. So we surrendered our lives, went back to school, Piedmont Baptist College there, and uh, had a chance to get finished up there, and then served as a pastor for 16 years, served some with Dr. Gary Chapman, who wrote The Five Love Languages, and, and we were enjoying the life of serving in different capacities, about half that time music and worship, and then some as a senior pastor. And about nine years ago, God began to work in my heart again, because I was concerned about the direction of our country. And I remember watching, been thinking about it, and praying about it in 2012, and end of that year, there was a national election and I remember it going the other direction. So I remember getting up out of the living room, walking down the hallway to where my wife was working in the bedroom. And I walked back there, kind of pulled my shoulders back. I said, babe, I'm running for the United States Congress. Now, some of you are married to smart women or have women in your life that ask very good questions that we're not always prepared with the right answers. And she said, well, do you know anybody in Raleigh or Washington, D.C.? I said, no, I probably should. Long story short, we took a step of faith there, and God began to open up the doors through a primary, then a runoff in a general election. And I, re I remember getting to Congress, and they didn't know who I was or where I came from. And the, and the second, weekend's there, second week I was there, yes, about the second or third week, my, uh, 
my chief of staff brings in this newspaper article, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post. He said, boss, I don't know how to tell you this, but you're ranked as the least wealthy member of the 114th class. I'm going, well, that, that tells you it's the Lord's doing, I guess. But off we went, but it was interesting to see kind of from that perspective of where we have kind of gotten off the kilt is when it comes to the direction of our country. And a lot of it, and I'm not going to spend time because we're here to, to examine the Lord's Word and get into that, but specifically as far how we've lost a generation when it comes to educating our children. There, there's a divide there between the older Democrats and younger Democrats, and I hate to be partisan, but I'm just going to tell you the truth like I try to do. The younger ones, it's become their religion to, to despise the Judeo-Christian principles that we, our country, was founded on. In fact, uh, the, the, the scripture verses are etched in stone and marble throughout Washington, D.C., talking about that heritage. But I will tell you this before we get into the scripture. Probably the darkest night in the six years in serving in the U.S. House was where we had introduced legislation on the floor. And the debate had raged well into the evening, maybe 10.30, 10.45 p.m. that evening. And the legislation simply said this, that if a baby somehow miraculously survives a botched abortion, the provider would then be required by law to sustain the baby's life. At the end of the night, only three from the other party voted that that baby should be allowed to live. And I remember there was, there's one other pastor that serves. I remember our eyes just kind of, we just looked at each other. And you could feel the oppression in the room that in America, that we would have that many people vote against, to me, beyond just the abortion argument, the fact that the baby is born alive. I remember going back to my office late that evening and, I opened up the top drawer, took three thank you cards, and I wrote three notes to the three Democrat friends or, that were willing to stand up for life. I knew what would happen. All three were primary. Two were taken out. Only one, Representative Congressman Henry Cuellar from San Antonio, Texas, actually a believer there in the area, has survived the onslaught of removing anything that's pro-life on the other side of the aisle. So what is our role as we think about this? What, what's our role as believers? How, how do we engage in the public arena? What are, what's our calling there? Because we've seen this movement, even among churches, this kind of progressive, woke ideology that you're not supposed to talk about those things anymore. And I, I get that you can go, I mean, there are things where you can't do and as far as uh, doing official campaign events and all the different things for people who are elected officials. However, we need men of God and we need pastors and we need husbands and wives who are informed, who understand what's happening and the evil that we're battling. It was touched on a little bit earlier by, by the gentleman. No great change in this country ever happened in your state capital, Washington, D.C. You see, they've, the government has always followed with what God's people, what he was doing in the church whether it was the Great Awakenings, the abolishment of slavery, all the different things that America would rank as top things or accomplishment, it didn't start in Washington. It started with the people of God, men and women of God, getting on their faces, getting on their knees, asking God for His guidance in moving this country forward. So thus, we all have a role. And I want to take what our role is as believers out of Matthew chapter 16. Uh, Matthew chapter 16 and we're going to look at verses 24 and 25. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 and 25. And uh, we'll read that in just a second. Maybe if I was going to break this pa a passage down, uh, or, or maybe give it a title, I would do this. I'm going to call it Three Action Steps of a Believer. Three Action Steps of a Believer. Here, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 and 25. The Bible says this. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In verse 25, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. Lord, we just pause for a moment. Lord, our hearts have been ministered to the music, through something that you have given us, the created. Lord, we ask that our hearts would be open today. I ask my heart would be open today uh, as we speak, as we share that you would really reveal in our lives to make sure that our lives are in a pursuit, or we, that we have a desire uh, to, be a, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that you would bless the reading today, bless our hearts as we go forward. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. amen. So, I used to think as a pastor, maybe even before that, in looking at this passage, I would often think these three things that we just talked about are kind of all one package. Uh, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. But the more I looked at this, the more I realized these are three different 
maybe kind of growth places or three different, maybe consecutive actions, but three separate and unique actions. So what I want to do is unpack a little bit today, and I want to start with the first one. The very first one that says, basically, if Jesus says, hey, if you want to be a disciple, here's number one, deny yourself. Now, I got to tell you real quick, when I woke up this morning, I didn't think about denying myself. That was not my first instinct. Actually, I was thinking, my, I've got a friend who's the mayor of a town here close to Greensboro who helps do some of the driving. I'm thinking, do we have time to get an Egg McMuffin? That's, that was my first impulse. It wasn't nothing about denying myself, right? But Jesus is saying right here, if you're going to be a disciple, if the world is going to see how God works at us in our culture, whatever culture that might be, the very first thing that he says is we learn to deny ourselves. Well, what does that look like in your life or my life? Let's unpack it just for a second. Well, I think part of that denial is a simple surrender of our will. Are we walking close enough to the Lord that we're instinctively thinking about, Lord, how can I deny myself where you can get the glory? Uh, maybe it's through uh, shutting off some of the activities that we're involved with. Uh, look, and I'm not talking about, in this first part of this, I'm not talking about things in our life that are ungodly or unhealthy. I'm just talking about noise. How many times do we keep noise, constant noise? I, you know, here's one of them right here. I keep it in my back pocket, right? It's a smartphone, okay? Who said something about me on Twitter? You know, nope, nope, nobody today so far. So yeah, all this kind of stuff, all social media, whatever it might be, we're always filling the void. But are we filling it with godly things, with spiritual things, with, with music, with praise? Are we doing that or are we kind of going back to the flesh? One of the things that, that Jesus clearly lays out, and he kind of models this in in the garden of Gethsemane when Jesus says, not my will, but yours be done. And he's doing it through that prayer, through fasting. Do we, do we think about fasting anymore? Do we think about just setting aside? Do we sometimes turn off the radio or turn off the phone, turn off the television and say, Lord, I'm just going to take 20 minutes here just to walk, just to fellowship with you, just speak to me here. Are we denying ourselves in a way that we're hearing from the Lord? Or are we walking through this autopilot, mechanical Christian life? Jesus is saying, the first thing that I'm asking you to do is make some space. Deny yourself for the reason that I can implement things in your life, that I can guide you as a compass of who you're to engage, of who do you interact with, that the Holy Spirit is working. You may encounter something today that if we respond instinctively out of the flesh, we may miss an opportunity that God is providing. But if we deny ourselves in walking with the Spirit, well, just when we think, okay, well, I've got some places, uh, Mark, that... That, that I can deny myself. Well, then Jesus says, number two is take up your cross. Now, if I had a problem with denying myself, I can tell you, uh, take up your cross. Uh, initially, when I'm processing that, I'm like thinking, man, that's an uncomfortable thought that Jesus has said right after to deny myself to take up my cross. You know, if I was to go around the room and ask, you know, how many look forward to taking up the cross? Well, I don't know that most of us are saying, oh, you know what, I did this or did that. I don't want to carry somebody. Let somebody else carry the cross for a while. But there's something unique that I want to unpack here in the next two or three minutes on this aspect of take up a cross. Because here's the thing. As a believer, we all have a cross to carry. Think about that. J Jesus is saying, take up your cross. He's talking to believers here that if you're going to be a disciple... Take up your cross. What does that cross look like in your life? Is it an illness? Is it financial? Is it marital or relational? Is it a wayward adult child or a parent that's struggling with something? What is that cross that God has asked you to carry? Because I, we could go down each row and every one of us could say, I would identify that cross in my life as this. Because here's the aspect of this. What's the cross for the cross is the journey portion of our Christian faith that burns the dross off that we are able to come forth as gold. There's, there's a reference, rejoice in the Lord, right? Uh, to, to be able to, to have those moments in those times that God is working through us in a way, because here's the essence of this. Man, when your team wins, when you get a little bonus in your check, when the kids are actually behaving or everybody shows up on time, all the different things that create stressors that we can check the box. Look, it's not very difficult to praise the Lord. But when all that unwinds and you're out there carrying a cross that you didn't plan for, that you didn't engage, what's our walk look like then? 
is the question this morning. See, some of us can carry the cross, but I would ask, are we doing it in a way that's making us bitter, or are we carrying the cross in a way that makes us better? You see, a lot of us sometimes, okay, we'll do it begrudgingly, and we miss the whole aspect of the joy. You know, one of the things that I have seen in the church, maybe the toughest cross to carry if I was having to rank those, is sometimes, specifically even in the church or in ministry, is the cross of an unforgiving spirit, or the cross of forgiveness. Let me put it that way. Here's why. It's because when we go out those doors as believers, we're kind of equipped. Over in Ephesians 6, man, we've got the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, sword of the spirit. We're like, come and get you. Those fiery darts, we get them, we'll catch, catch them all over the place, right? Quenching them all. But what happens many times is that when we get hit from inside the camp, we weren't ready for that one. In many times in the church, somebody has done something, somebody has said something, or sometimes in our family, it's inside the camp that seems just to take those legs out. And for many times, and I've seen this even in the church, where you got one side of the friends or family sitting on this side, even at a funeral, one side because 10 years ago or 20 years ago, somebody did something, or somebody said something, and the enemy has used that to literally rob the joy of the Christian journey that God has called you to live. That forget. And here, let me give you a little example. I got a chance to play a little quarterback in high school. It was a small school. Probably wouldn't have made the team if it was a big school. Nevertheless, I got to play quarterback, right? So our coach uh, that was uh, kind of old school coach, uh, used to do this thing called bull in the ring. I don't even know if it's politically correct anymore. So, So you would form a circle, and you would put the players around it, and the guy in the middle, you would give him the football. Now, I didn't understand why the quarterback needed to be in the drill with the offensive or defensive lineman, but he thought there was some kind of moral value that it would help me later in life. Who knows if that's right or not. So he would call a number. So you're in the middle here, and he would call a number. Number 22. So you would turn, and you would kind of get your center of gravity, and you would hit number 22 and number 88. And after three or four of these, he may say number 72. Well, I'm thinking number 72 was my, to my right, but 72 was actually to my left. And before I could get turned to get my center of gravity, right in the ear hole, and your bell's ringing, and how many fingers am I holding up? One, two, three. Back then it was just if you, if you get close enough, they'd get you back in the game. <laughs> Probably can't do that anymore. But the aspect of, is this, is when I was able to set my center of gravity, and I was able to embrace whatever was going to hit me, I, I could feel it. But it was in those moments where I was disoriented or I I was expecting the attack to come this way that it caught me in the blind side and it leveled me. The the point I'm making is this, is the enemy knows where your walk is. The enemy knows what you're engaging. And many times he's going to use something from inside the camp to literally get you to the place where the, the way that you're carrying that cross is designed literally becomes a burden as opposed to something that God is meaning for good for your life. Has somebody done something or said something, uh, whether they meant it or not? It doesn't say whether it was unfair, unjust, or ungodly. I mean, this is the part sometimes, even if I'm preaching, God puts, brings things to my mind that I'm like, man, I'm wanting to scrap on that, I'm wanting to hang on to that, or that was wrong, or this person, should, that, that shouldn't have happened. But God just said, listen, this, if this is the cross that I've asked you to carry, none of that matters except how the world is viewing you when you carry the cross. How are your brothers and sisters viewing this when you carry the cross? Look, there are things that are going to happen to you. I was given a commencement address not too long ago, and the two things that I promised them was, number one, adversity, number two is opportunity, and how you handle adversity sometimes determines what kind of opportunities you may have. But from the spiritual concept, this is the aspect that God has asked us to do is when we're carrying that cross. Look, I know some of it. Some of us have been through brokenness. And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that it's not painful. But you have to trust either God means it for your good or he doesn't. And the word of God tells us that he is wanting you to come forth as gold. Now, I know this sounds a little bit gloom and doom, but we're making a shift here because I want you to think about the first two aspects. Jesus said, if any man has a desire, okay, if you want to be my disciple... Number one, to deny, to deny yourself. Number two is to take up your cross. But I want you to compare this with Matthew 11.30 because this is where maybe to the world it doesn't make sense. Matthew 11.30 says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now hang on a second, right? 
You just said, tell me I've got to deny myself and I've got to take up my cross. And you're dropping some cross reference over here where Jesus is saying, look, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How can we square that paradox? Seemingly contradiction. How can we do it? Well, here's the essence of this. is when we try to carry the cross in our own strength, it becomes a weight and it becomes something that is painful. But when we are able to surrender it, when we give that cross back to the Lord, then and only then does his yoke become easy and his burden become light. Now, how many times? Hey, right here, I'm first in line. I'm guilty. I'll be out there and I'll encounter something. And at first, I'm like, all right, Lord, you got to take this. But it's not long before I kind of want to grab the wheel again. For I want to say, look, uh, Lord, uh, maybe you could help somebody else. I think I got it from here. And how soon do I end up in the ditch with it? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. What a promise that is. That even as we're carrying the cross, that when we're able to do so in a way that we're able to surrender that, to give it back to the Lord, it is those moments when the world says there's something different about that person. That person claims the name of Jesus Christ. I've seen him on the mountain, but as they've encountered something that was unfair, they were able to give it back to the Lord. That my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Deny yourself and to take up your cross. But then there's a third aspect of this. We don't, we don't often think about this, in, I guess, in this light. Sometimes maybe we just assume, well, I've denied myself, I've taken up the cross, everything's good, right? Not necessarily. The rich young ruler tried to make that case to Jesus. Lord, since I was young, I've checked all these boxes. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and then follow Jesus. That's directional. That's an action step there that wherever Jesus is calling he is asking us to be willing to follow. And here's the amazing thing that's kind of culminating all this. Over in Ephesians 3.20, he's talking about doing something exceedingly abundantly more than I could ever process, that I could ever hope, that I could ever dream. You know, so many times, so many times, and, and I'm, I've been there, we put margins on what we think God can do in our lives. Lord, I didn't go to the right school. I don't have the right background. I don't have the right personal wealth. Uh, you know, I went to this. I, I, I remember about three years ago, 2019, in January, we were starting a new session, and I was named the ranking member on our Homeland Security Intelligence and Counterterrorism Subcommittee. And uh, very interesting work. And, and I remember our first day before we go into a classified hearing, I'm looking through all the dossiers with the resumes, and, you know, get big Ivy degrees here. They get all the way down. My, my closest friend there, uh, John Ratcliffe, who became President Trump's Director of National Intelligence, he was the runt in the litter. He had undergraduate at Notre Dame Law School at SMU. And then they get to me. You know, they get all these bios. I had one paragraph, Piedmont Bible College. And I kind of looked at that, and, and I just kind of chuckled to myself, this is the Lord. This is just like the Lord who confounds the why sometimes. It gives us opportunities when we're willing to be able to Deny ourselves, take up our cross, but then make the decision to follow Jesus. So many times, I think of Moses. Remember Moses' encounter at the burning bush? God, I'm not the orator in the family. You know, that's Aaron's job. Uh, so maybe you'd want him to... We, we do that with the Lord all the time in our life. Uh, whether it's a daily aspect or whether it's a career, vocation, whatever it might be, or even encountering somebody at lunch today. Well, I'm not the, I'm not the gifted speaker. I'm not this, I'm not that. We're always kind of pushing back on sometimes the Holy Spirit and what he's wanting to call us. But Jesus said, here, the final aspect of this is to follow Jesus. Basically means you're no longer in control of the direction that God is guiding you. Now, at first, you're like, well, hang on a second. Well, this, is, this, is, this, whole, this whole scripture reference here is about surrender. It's, it's one, of the, one of the, I was speaking at a, I was blessed to be the only person in my party to be invited to give a commencement address at a historical black college university. Uh, there's about 100 throughout the country. I was talking about Psalms 139, uh, that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, that God knew you when you were in your mother's womb. That means he's got a specific purpose and plan for each and every one of your life. This young lady down here, God's got a perfect plan for your life one day. Senior adult, tomorrow God's got a perfect plan for your life. His mercies are new each morning. Give us today our daily bread. Are we willing to give that back to the Lord and say, Lord, tomorrow, tonight, I will follow you wherever you're calling me to go? Or are we saying, conditions? I'll do this as long as it's in my comfort zone or in my skill set or whatever it might be. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus. I I think this is an essence as far as when it comes to 
when it comes to following the Lord. I, I, because uh, you never know where God's going to lead you or encounter you. I, I was co-chair of the prayer caucus, and I'll unpack this a little bit and, and start bringing this home. So a lot of people don't know there's a prayer caucus in Congress. Uh, the schedule normally is you would fly in D.C. on a Monday afternoon, your first vote for that evening. There's about a 35, maybe 40-minute gap sometime between your first vote at 6.30 p.m. and a little bit after 7 p.m. Well, if you're looking at the State of the Union, where the President gives the State of the Union, if you're looking back to the President's left, behind the cloakroom, there's a room called 219. And every Monday evening, once we fly in, there is about 15 or 20 men and women that literally come together, that pray and seek God's guidance for the direction of our country. And, and having the chance to lead that for about almost four and a half, close to five years, I, I remember getting a call one night uh, from uh, President Trump's White House, and he was inviting some people over before the National Day of Prayer. He knew I was one of the religious guys uh, in, in the house. And uh, of course, we uh, made our way over that evening, and there's about three or four House members and maybe two or three senators and a couple others or so, maybe a few others in the room, just a dining room right outside the Oval Office. And we were having dinner, and President Trump was discussing all these world religions. And he talked about the, a conversation he had had with the Pope and the rise of radical fundamentalist Islamist groups that are there in Europe and changing the continent. And you know sometimes when you're in a conversation or you're engaging somebody, the Holy Spirit begins to kind of prompt you, okay, this is, this is your time to say something. This is your time to share. I wish I could tell you I've always been obedient in that prompting, but sometimes I've been so busy with Mark Walker stuff that I haven't denied myself enough to say I'm going to use this opportunity. Well, I wasn't going to miss that one. So finally, I waited for an opening with President Trump. Sometimes it's hard to, to find an opening, um, but, but I waited for the opening. I said, we see, Mr. President, that's the difference between all other world religions and Christianity. He said, what's, what's that? mock in his New York accent. I didn't correct him. And I, I, I said, well, all these other world religions require you to do something for salvation. He kind of looked at me. I said, but in Christianity, it's what we call the atonement. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, Mr. President, that was shed at the cross of Calvary for your sins and for my sins. And for about two or three minutes, I just kind of dropped the gospel on him. And I, I remember walking out of the White House uh, a couple hours later, waiting for my staff to pick me up there on the corner of Pennsylvania Avenue, thinking this. And I'm just a small-town, independent Baptist preacher's kid who got to share the gospel with the President of the United States of America. You know what my second thought, second thought was? Was I just as motivated to share that with the grocery store clerk the next day or the gas station attendant? Would his or her heart and soul been just as important to me as sharing it with the President? See, God is guiding us, and when we're, way, when we're able to walk in a way where we're able, as he says, deny ourselves, take up a cross, and to follow Jesus, this is the essence of being able to have those intersections where we're in tune with the Spirit to be able to say, let me tell you about a living water where you'll never thirst again. I, I think nobody embodies this, and I'll close with this aspect of it. I, I don't think anybody embodies this more than my father who is in his words, shucking the corn right now, be 77 years old here in June, in a couple of months. Uh, my father has lived out his faith. Parents, dads, moms, it's so important. When you're consistent in your faith, the impact that it has on those around you, specifically your children. I, as I said, I remember growing up in, in that pastor's home, and, and we played a lot of sports, played a lot of ball, uh, with mom, had to do a little homework, but nevertheless, we would come home from school and we would do something there. And we got to this thing where we started, uh, that, we, that we had started doing recently, and, and I, uh, we would put on our camouflage, but we got to where we enjoyed taking our BB guns, right? And those old BB guns, you could almost see the trajectory on those things. It wasn't exactly the rocket launch, but we got where we were shooting each other with the BB guns, right? And the rule was to shoot low, but there was something just so exhilarating about shooting my little brother and hearing him squeal in the back of the thigh when I had an opportunity to do that, right? And, and, but we would do that. I think I was about 14. One brother was 12. One was almost 10. And, and we would do that. And, and this is interesting as I'm thinking how apropos this is with the journey uh, with, with Brother Ron Hamilton. And I remember talking and, and listening to mom. And she said, no, you boys better not be messing with those BB guns because you might put, and I, and I okay, all right. You grew up in the South like I did, all right? So one afternoon, we're out there, and, and my brother had kind of shot me there, I think right above the knee, and I was about ready to pull the trigger. Obviously, we kept it, kept it low. 
And about the time my middle brother, uh, that I was returning fire, so to speak, uh, he dove by a big, behind a big pile of pine needles. And it seemed like no, shooter, no sooner that I had pulled the trigger on that little BB gun is I heard this blood-curdling cry, cry. And he pops up immediately, begins to run to me, and he's got his hand over his eye. And I pull his hand down, almost yank it down because he's holding on tight. And I look into his eye, and it's so full of crimps in its blood, it's almost black. And we got him to the little town, Milton, their hospital. They could do nothing with him. We were trying to track down my father who was doing a funeral. We got him over, or they actually got him over to the University of West Florida Hospital in, in Pensacola, Florida. Finally got a hold of my dad. We got there, and, and I remember kind of cowering in the back and listening to the, doc, the doctor said, and he told my parents this. He said, I don't have good news at this point. He said, you see, not only has one eye been damaged, but the same optic nerve that controls sight to both eyes has been damaged, and he may lose sight in both eyes. Now, I remember thinking, I'm 52 years old, soon be 53. I don't know that I've ever remember hearing anything more sobering than to think about would I lead the rest of my life knowing that I was responsible, I was the big brother in, in blinding my middle brother. We made the decision that evening that we would spend the night there, but we needed some things about 20 miles from Pensacola to Milton. And I didn't want to stay with Clay because I didn't know what to say to him. I didn't really want to ride with my father because I knew at some point that wrath was coming. And, but I almost remember even thinking I was ready for it because I knew I deserved it. And we got in that little Toyota Tercel across the Interstate 10 Bridge. I, I certainly didn't sit in the front seat. I kind of cowered in the back seat. And after a few minutes, I looked up at my father saw this tear coming out of his eye. He put over a little rest area that doesn't exist anymore. He didn't say anything to me. I was deserving of it. But he began to pray. And as a 14-year-old pastor's kid, I remember what he prayed. He said, God, we have served you faithfully. He said, my hope and my confidence is in you and kind of walked through the different things as far as how they had been faithful to the Lord. He said, because of that, I believe that you can heal clay. Then he paused. He said, but Lord, if this is the cross that we're to carry, that more people will hear the name of Jesus, that more people through our suffering could one day have a personal relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, if that's what you called us, that I want you to know I'm laying it down right now and I'll trust you with it. He put that little five-speed in reverse, drove home, we went back to the hospital that evening, spent the night. The next morning, the doctor came in and he pulled those bandages off Clay's eyes. He looked at my dad, he looked back at Clay, and he looked back at my parents, he said, Sir, you must be those praying kind of people. And my dad said, As a matter of fact, we are. He said, Well, he said, last night this eye looked like a shattered window pane. It's fused back together this morning. He should have 20-20 vision in both eyes. Now, say that because of this. I, I can't tell you, if I'm going to be transparent, that that would be my prayer, if that was one of my children. I don't know that that's where my faith is. But the example that I'm trying to communicate or relate to you of the trust that we can have in the Lord Jesus Christ, when we faithfully process and then make the decision to say this, Lord, you've told us in your word that if I'm going to come after you, that if I'm going to be a disciple, to deny myself, to take up my cross, and wherever it is, whatever direction, to say I'll trust you and I'll follow you. Is that where my journey is today? I have to ask myself, if I, honestly, if I'm preaching this, I've got to check myself. I'm asking you the same. Is that for your journey? Do you have confidence in the Lord? Are you in a season of maybe doubt? Maybe, there, maybe because of things that you're encountering, maybe because of some of the sickness or things. That, it, are there moments there sometimes where we say, Lord, I'm waning in that trust. You know, this, that's the amazing thing about God's grace is that he wants that relationship to be renewed. Maybe today you're in here, you came in here with a friend or somebody, maybe you're visiting, or maybe you've just been here for, for many years. And you might say this, you know what, I, I don't even know what all this journey is about. 
I will tell you this, if you're an unbeliever, if you've never had or accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I could go down to every single person in this world, no matter the brokenness, no matter where God has allowed us to go, there's not a single believer in this room that would say they would trade one second of that journey. So if you're here today, I hope and pray that you'll open up your heart today. I'm going to close in prayer, and Pastor Tim, if you would come. Father God, we we'll just pause for a moment. Lord, this isn't always the biggest raw, raw message and even kind of just digging it out, checking us. Lord, you've, you've asked us that in this world, in our culture, in this country, people need to see difference. There's so much nominal Christianity, even among politics, even among our party, if you'll go that far, Lord. All this is going on. We need people who have genuine relationships with you to engage our culture in all different aspects, specifically in this country, even in the political arena. Lord, but may our hearts be so in tune with you that we have this confidence and trust in you that whatever it is that we're willing to deny ourselves to take up the cross that you've, that you've chosen for us, that's meant for our own good, to be able to follow that we can have the joy in living out the Christian journey. Lord, I pray that also today if there is someone in this room this morning that doesn't know or doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, may this be the morning the Holy Spirit convicts their heart of such. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Let's stand, please. Maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart. He has spoken to mine. Can I just say that I have a cross that I've been praying about? someone here today there's something you're praying about and in this moment the Lord would say trust me with this trust me with it fully and as one has said in acceptance there is peace Lord if this is what you want now certainly you've allowed it this is what you want. I embrace it by faith even now. Give me your grace and your strength. Let the Lord do a genuine work in your heart. A deeper work. Sometimes it's very personal, very private. But God knows the thoughts, the very intents of our heart. That's where the word of God goes. Whatever God is speaking to you about, talk to the Lord right where you are or around this altar. This altar is always open if you'd like to come and pray. There may be some families that want to come and just say, Lord, help us to trust you. I remember being in a meeting in Atlanta, Georgia, waiting for a phone call, and I had told the Lord that morning, God, if this is not your will, please close the door. I got the phone call. The door was closed. It still broke my heart because I prayed so earnestly that God would let this happen. I never forget walking behind that church and looking up to the Lord and just saying, Lord, by your help, I'm going to trust you with this. I'm going to trust you with this fully. Help me. And I'm so thankful that I can tell you God honored that. God brought so much good and even better than I was asking him for. I don't know what God's going to do in your life. Maybe there's someone here today, you just say, I need to just say, Lord, I trust you with this. I trust you. Some have come, this altar's open. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, we'd love to show you from the Bible how you can be saved, believing Jesus died for you and rose again. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I believe Jesus died for me, and I believe he rose again, as you say in the scriptures. Lord, I trust him by faith. Please save me. Please forgive my sin. God has promised them that come to him, he in no wise will cast out. Trust him today, friend. We can pray with you here, or you can pray right where you are. Salvation's not in coming forward, being baptized, joining the church. It's by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
call upon him even now. Let the Lord help you. Let's sing a verse of invitation. And as some of these are praying, others of us, God has spoken in our hearts. I don't know what we're going to be called to bear, even yet going forward. But I've told Rebecca many times, I said, we can't leave God out of the equation of this circumstance. Let's look for the Lord in it. Let's look for what he wants to teach us. And let's just trust him. No wonder Paul said, having therefore obtained help from God, I continue this day. The only way I'm here today is God has helped me. So many of us can say that. Isn't that right? That's how I'm here today. God in heaven helped me. And he is helping us truly, fully, faithfully. What a Savior. Let's sing a verse. 489. Would you turn there and let's sing this from our hearts as unto the Lord. Jesus, I Make this your prayer. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. Live. I surrender all. I surrender. Thank you for the message. God bless you. And uh, perhaps uh, you would like to greet uh, Brother Walker in uh, just a moment in the lobby if you can. And, uh, and then also uh, out in the lobby, the uh, Majesty Music has a table with some materials there and some things that will be of encouragement and blessing to you. But uh, I hope you'll take time to fellowship and, and speak to someone today. Bring it all in this morning. Really, we all just need the Lord. I need the Lord. My family needs the Lord. This church needs the Lord. Our community, our city, our state, our country needs the Lord. And we're praying for others and that God would help them in these days. But I want to encourage you. Your life can be used of God to make a positive, eternal difference in the lives of others. You've got to see that, and you've got to receive that and lay hold of that opportunity and make the most of it, and may the Lord help us in this day. I've been blessed. I hope you have. I've been challenged. God has spoken in my heart. I want us to close in prayer. Let's all bow together. Our Father, we thank you for your word and its power in our hearts, and Lord, I thank you for how you've spoken to me. Help me to trust you, Lord. We're never going to get beyond needing to trust you in this life. But I want to thank you that really, as we understand it, and as we work through things by faith, you bring us to a place to where we see your loving kindness, your true steadfastness, your loyalty, your devotion, that love that never fades. And I pray, Lord, that we would enter in even into the fellowship of your sufferings for whatever that cross may be for us individually. And, Lord, embrace it by faith. And, Lord, even see great blessing, great victory come out of that. God, you're the wonderful, great God of heaven who even brings good out of bad. Lord, you're not limited. You're not bound by our missteps or those of others. Oh, God, help us now. We humble ourselves before you. Bless these who are here this morning, Brother Adam and Lord... I pray you bless him and his family and Miss Hamilton, Brother Ron. I pray you bless them today. Bless Brother Walker and his family. Help us all, Lord, to do our part as your children to be that salt and light in this day, in this place, for your glory, in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you for being here. Greet someone. I hope you'll greet these folks on your way out and let them know how much you appreciate them being used of the Lord today. God bless you. Thank you.